G'day guys, today we're going to talk about the Anglo-Saxon Fjord. Anglo-Saxon Fjord is essentially a regional levy. It is a, basically a militia uh, and I suppose the modern day equivalents to the Fjord would be things like um, the National Guard in America or the Territorial Army in England. In fact the Territorial Army or the TA as it's generally known uh, is, provides a number of very similar and a very a number of very similar purposes to the feud of its time. We know that, uh, as with many Germanic tribes, the Anglo-Saxon feud was compulsory military service uh, that consisted, roughly speaking, of 40 days a year, um, varied slightly, and there were different levels of the feud. We'll get to that in a second. Under King Canute especially, there were fines for not doing military service, uh, and that could vary according to your rank in society, but you'd be looking at roughly 60 shillings if you were an, a common man, or up to 120 shillings if you were a noble, plus possibly loss of lands and title, depending on the severity of the crime. We'll talk about Anglo-Saxon law in a different video, but let's go, let's talk about the feud. There, there is still a lot of debate in uh, historic circles around the exact nature of the feud and the composition of the feud. In other words, was it principally provided by uh, farmers and fishermen and those kind of people, or was it comprised as well as by thanes and nobles and other people in Anglo-Saxon society? We, we really don't know. And I think that's one of the interesting differences with today's military in today's military, we're all provided with a specific number um, that identifies you uniquely. And therefore, the army can track very easily exactly which people are exactly where at exactly when in, in terms of time. So it's, it's a bit difficult uh, from a historic perspective to sort of really understand the nature of the feuds. And there would have been variations according to the exact time period and the exact noble and exactly where you were in terms of uh, the, geogra the geography of the, the time. We do know, however, that the Anglo-Saxon feud was able to be rapidly deployed via horse. And that included not only the individual, but their logistics and supply train as well. Unfortunately, lost to history is how all of that worked. We do know that there was a, a whole um, network of burrs and fortifications set up by Alfred the Great. We do know that Alfred the Great also set up a, a network of roads and rehabilitated Roman roads to provide easy access between these uh, fortifications to enable his army to move around the country with incredible speed. For example, they went from you know London to the Battle of uh, Fulford in just a matter of days. Uh, that is an incredible distance covered very, very quickly. And I, I think uh, even soldiers of today would, would struggle to, to be able to do that. Um, so I think it's, it's very interesting and to understand the motivations of the soldiers um, because to be able to cover those kind of distances, carrying all that equipment would have been very difficult to do. We don't know how they were supplied in terms of their medical assets. Um, we don't know um, it, was there a rank structure and we don't know how that would have worked. We don't know um, how the logistics would have worked in terms of transport and food because 
if you think that a fjord, uh, you know, a group of fjords together, which would have been sent up to Fulford or then down to Hastings, um, that would have required thousands of horses to be able to feed all of those horses, to be able to keep them shod, to be able to uh, keep them healthy. Um, we, we don't know how many veterinarians were employed or how many doctors or how many you know, other people. And we don't know how that would have worked in terms of uh, the supply train, uh, which is a real shame. Um, the historical sources such as um, Bede and the Anglo-Saxon uh, Chronicles, they really record the event as in, you know, this particular battle occurred on, in this particular year. It doesn't even necessarily record the month. Um, and it often says, you know, this earl or this king was, led, led the army, but it doesn't say how many soldiers or, or where those fjords were, were, were raised. Um, so, there's, unfortunately, the sources of information we have, great as they are, don't always tell us the, the history and don't provide the context, which is a, a real shame. Um, but then they weren't written for that. They were written for... Um, the, they were written very much with an agenda for the, for the nobles um, and for the people living at that time. We know as the Anglo-Saxon period progressed that the Fjord separated essentially into two distinct organisations. There was the Select Fjord, uh, which essentially was a royal Fjord based around Wessex and it was feudal to the king, in other words, it served the king, and it primarily consisted of a number of thanes, the thanes retainers, as in um, the people that the thane employed to support them. So we're talking things like cooks, blacksmiths, and all kinds of different... Um, <laughs> There may be a whole range of bodyguards and huskars and other people that were employed directly by specific thanes. The earls and their own retainers, and then a number of reeves. We don't know how many um, people in that context were just ordinary farmers and fishermen and so on. The other side of the fjord was the local militia. Now these were specific to individual shires often um, and they were essentially given three burdens of service. One was military ser service, the second was uh, work to retain, to maintain the fortresses and the third was bridge repair. That was regarded as a common burden. The other specific thing that we don't know, and, and there's a lot of assumptions built around this, but there's no evidence really um, that we can find in any of the source material that gives any indication of female warriors. Although we do know that um, Athelred, the daughter of King Alfred the Great, led armies against the Vikings, but we don't know precisely what role she played, as in, did she herself fight or was she more in the background doing the commanding? So there's a lot of unknowns around that. Unfortunately, the source material doesn't give us the, the answers we perhaps like. There we go, guys. That's the Anglo-Saxon Fjord. I really hope you enjoyed today's video. Please like, subscribe and share. I'll catch you in my next video.